Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Uh, y'all ain't out there wrangling kids on a water slide. Y'all got to have a little bit more energy than that this morning. Are y'all good? Now, see, y'all don't understand that. I done, I done been at a camp all week with a bunch, about 500 teenagers, and we've been partying and celebrating with Jesus. So forgive me for being asking one more time, but are y'all glad to be here at church this morning? Okay. Because I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you four reasons why you should be celebrating this morning, this morning to start this church service. All right? Because by you guys helping us out, investing in what we do here at Grace, by investing in this youth ministry, all the way back in February when y'all bought them heart-shaped biscuits for y'all sweethearts and your people that you work with, all the way through all the prayers, everything. Uh, we had an awesome week this past week down in White Oak. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Susan Cheek and Hannah Horton for going with me and helping chaperone. They are awesome and amazing. They do a wonderful job. Um, but it's not about us. It's about these kids. And we had 11 kids go this year. And we kind of got through a slow start the first of the week. But then we got to Wednesday and it kind of picked up. And then, as always, night four happens. And if you go to camp with me and if you go to any camp or you know the teenagers, they will tell you that when night four happens, things pick up. And so it picked up, and from the end of that service all the way to the end of our group study, uh, God showed up and showed out. So I'm here to give you four good reasons to celebrate church this morning because we have four young people who said they wanted to claim Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And they didn't want any more doubts. They didn't want any more insecurity. They wanted to know that they know that they know. And I'm here to tell you that they prayed and we prayed, and we loved, and we cried, and we celebrated. So I'm going to ask them four to come up this morning. We got, we got my man Brody right here. We've got Dakota. We've got Elliot. we got Cohen. Now, Cohen slightly injured, but not because we were celebrating too hard, okay? So y'all can ask him about that injury after the service. But um, church, this is why we do what we do. Amen? Amen. This is why we pray. This is why... This is why we do things throughout the year to be intentional, to make relationships, to give the opportunities for these kids to get something a little bit extra that they don't get quite all the time here. And that's what that camp does. And so all four of these young people, uh, we are super proud of you. I want you to look out here and look at all the, your, your family members out here. Now, some of y'all, y'all been here for a while, so this is y'all's already family, but the, they're even more so your family now. And church, I want you to look at these four young people, and I want us to be super intentional from this point on, because every time you see them, whether it's here at the church, whether it's out somewhere, whether it's in Walmart trying to get in the self-checkout line, whatever the case may be, I want you to be able to love on them and tell them that you're praying for them, because that means everything. Because we know that it's not an easy walk being a Christian. It's not an easy life sometimes because you get challenged. And they're going to get challenged real soon because schools start back. But we said the other day that we're going right into the mission field. We celebrate now, but it's just like my man Dabo said. We had a win the other night, but we're going right back to work. So our work is going back out there, and they want to share what they discovered, what they found, what they secured this past week, and they want to go give it to their friends and family out there. So that's worth celebrating this morning. That's worth us being prayerful for and so we love you guys and uh, preacher Jason they'll be probably be talking about talking with you and you know doing stuff that they do you know but um we are really proud of them um Dakota is uh Denise and Walter's daughter um she is she doesn't come to church here but she always goes on our trips because you know we're just cool like that um but they are they are working at their church to get their youth group going and Dakota is fired up she's ready to go and tell all her friends at her church and, and make a big impact. And uh, all these guys, I had a chance, I was stuck in a room with all of them. <clears throat> so we shared about Jesus and we had to maneuver through some other things, you know, you know, because, you know, boys outside playing, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things. So they, they had an awesome week. I had an awesome week with them in church. I just wanted to celebrate what Jesus is doing. And uh, thank you guys for supporting this ministry. And we are going to have sign-up beginning on September 1st for next year's somersault. You guys can go sit down. We are going to have sign-up starting September 1st for somersault. And I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm not getting preachy. I'm just going to leave this with you. I oftentimes tell people and I tell parents and I tell other youth that these camps should be the first priority of their summer. 
Now, I know we have a lot of people that have a lot of traditions during the summer. They go a lot of places. They do a lot of things the same way, the same place, the same time every year. I got news for you. I bake chocolate chip cookies every Christmas Eve. But sometimes I eat them at my house. Sometimes I eat them at my mom's. Sometimes I eat them in the garage. Sometimes I may eat them outside. Point being is that if this is not something that's a priority, I'm challenging you today to make sure your youth, your grandchildren, their friends are a part of this because there's four good reasons right here why they should be there. And that's all I'm going to say about that. That's my soapbox this morning. Now I'm going to go up here and hide behind the cross in the wilderness and play this morning. So here, Jess, that's all it you, Lee, thank you uh, for what you do, for leading these young people and uh, pointing them towards Jesus. And it is a reason to celebrate this morning. We celebrate with you guys as all of heaven has celebrated. We celebrate with you. Um, we welcome you here. Hope you have felt welcome coming in. If you look around and think, gum, where is everybody? They're out there. They're, they're out back. Uh, there's about 70 to 80 kids, last count, running around wet and wild worship. Uh, there's a pile of adults out there. And uh, so that's where all the fun, I think, is happening. But I, I, I believe we're going to have some fun in here, too. But um, so, yeah, this morning kicks off Vacation Bible School. And um, Vacation Bible School goes uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, beginning at 6 o'clock. If you're helping with Vacation Bible School, um, Carol wants you to be here tomorrow evening at 5.30. Uh, we'll have dinner, and then we'll go into um, sending the kids off to their respective classes and everything they'll be doing. If you have not, listen, listen closely, if you have not as an adult volunteered or signed up to help, there will be an adult Bible study in here that I will be leading. All right? So I just wanted that to be made aware of. So if, you, if you're not volunteering and want to still be a part of Vacation Bible School, you can as an adult. You can either volunteer to help if you have not, or you can come in here for a Bible study on Monday and Tuesday night. So please keep that in mind. Um, a few other things to point out to you. In way of announcement, um, this past Wednesday, Ricky led a Bible study in here for us, um, and then he will be leading another study on the 24th in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock, so please keep that in mind. Um, beginning July 31st, I will be leading a study in the sanctuary on the book of James, so please keep that in mind. That's at 7 o'clock. Um, also, with Vacation Bible School, we have a snow cone machine out back today. Everybody loves the snow cones. So Carol wants me to invite you and encourage you to grab your snow cone before you leave. You do have to pay for it because of the company that's providing it, but show them some love um, before you leave today. So I would encourage you there. Uh, we have church meetings today, trustees at 2 o'clock, finance church council at 3 o'clock, and then we have a uh, very quick video. Todd, I know it's taking us a while to get through announcements today, but just hang tight with us. You are about to go on a journey to see how a Rise Against Hunger meal makes it into the hands of those who need it most. Welcome to one of Rise Against Hunger's school feeding programs located in Lusaka, Zambia, where over 40 children gather to learn and share a lunch. For many of these children, this will be their only meal of the day. These meals do more than just nourish the body. They allow the students to focus advance their education, and most importantly, provide hope for a brighter future. Every day, Rise Against Hunger meals are served around the globe in medical clinics, vocational training programs, elder care facilities, and schools just like this. Each meal is a moment to celebrate. It's a step on the path to zero hunger by the year 2030. Let's take a look at how each of these moments is made possible. It all begins when a group gathers to host and take part in a meal packaging event. Before the big day, raw ingredients are ordered, prepped and loaded onto Rise Against Hunger trucks to be delivered. When the event is set up, volunteers begin filing in, donning gloves and hairnets and getting settled at their stations, knowing with confidence that alongside their friends, family and members of the community, they are going to be changing lives with each meal they package. At the conclusion of a meal packaging event, these pallets are sent to our on-the-ground partners via shipping containers. After reaching the destination port, 
containers are unloaded and pallets of meals are distributed to our impact partners. The meals are prepared in bulk to feed the children at the school. The effect of these meals is community-wide. The hands at our meal packaging events are the last ones to touch the meals before they are unboxed and served to those children and families who need them the most. Together, we can create a world where hunger doesn't exist. You'll be hearing more about this. Um, this event that's this coming up, and uh, we, Grace, have been invited to partner with about four other churches in this community um, for Sunday, October the 13th, to gather, I think, at the Civic Center where the supplies will be delivered. And we, we come together as a community and as churches, and we help package these meals. It's an easy way to be the hands and the feet of Christ, to feed the hungry. And so just, just put that date in the back of your mind, Sunday, October the 13th, You'll be hearing more information about it. Our outreach committee um, wanted to partner with the other churches to do this. I think it is an exciting thing. In fact, outreach gave a portion of their, of their funds and in their budget, budgeted money to go towards um, this, this mission and this project. So please keep that in mind. And again, you'll be hearing more information about this as we get closer. Um, today we're here because a life connected to God and a life connected to one another is the most meaningful life there is. If you will, I would invite you to stand with me. As we join together in affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed, these words that are passed down generation to generation in the life of the church, these words reminding us when we say we are Christian, this is the very basic of who we are. Let us join together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue standing as we continue our um, worship and song this morning with Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I come to you in humble prayer, Lord. Calm my spirit so I really don't have the words, but you're going to bring them through me. I pray that something I say will reach someone, Lord. Ultimately, I just want to have a pure heart, Lord. A heart that seeks after you above anything in this world, Lord. To cancel out all the noise, Lord, of the world and channel in on you. You need to be our lighthouse and our storms, Lord. Whatever storm may come in our life, Lord. Just always know that we can focus on you and come to you for the answers, Lord. Bless us as we get Bible school rolling this week, Lord. Pray that, again, we be our, your hands and feet in whatever way you need us to be. Bless Jason as he brings us the sermon, Lord, all the other parts of the service, Lord, and just help us to love others unconditionally, Lord, the way you, would, you have always loved us, especially given your life on the cross for me, who is very unworthy, Lord, but... So I want to live a life that's thankful and grateful for that, Lord, for that sacrifice. And never take that sacrifice for granted. And help us pray as you taught your disciples to pray, Lord. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is not just for daily bread. Deliver us from our trespassers. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. And greet those around you and welcome them to grace. And at this time, if you could make your way back to your seats, we're going to have a seat on this song as we sing today. We pray that you focus on the words and focus on God during this.
Church, let us continue worshiping as we have this chance and this opportunity to give back to God a portion of what is God's with God's tithe and our offering. And to know that as we're reminded each and every week, as we give, we give knowing that our giving helps share the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's the good news of Jesus Christ that changes lives. If you want your life changed, turn to Jesus. He will change it. And so in our giving, let us know that the hope of Jesus is transforming this community, it's transforming this state, and it's transforming this world because lives are being impacted by this church, by this church. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you're using us. God, as I told somebody the other day, um, in spite of who I am, you're still using me to do your work. God, you're still using each and every one of us somehow, some way to share some hope, to share some light, and to share some love of Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that you would use us beyond our imagination. And God, this morning we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for how you have provided for us and you do provide for us each and everything we need every day of our life. So God, now we give back to you what is yours, your tithe and our offering, and we pray, Jesus, that you would still use us. You would use us, you would use the giving to transform lives of other people. God, so they would know what it is to be in relationship with you. To know that they are loved by you. We pray all this in the power of Jesus. In his holy name. Amen.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no Let's stand together now as we present God's tithes and our offerings. Good morning. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Love for one another. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of God for the people of God. As the worship team was singing that last song, I was reminded of something else that uh, I think the church should know that Lee didn't share with you. And I'll preface it this way. You know, the church has often been said that it's not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. But in addition to that, the church is all, also should be a mission outpost. And what I mean is that we come together not just for perfect church attendance, but we come together to be equipped so that we can go out. And part of that being equipped and sending out 
is recognizing leadership potential in other people. And I say all that to say, in, in, in the midst of our youth, there are a couple who have publicly said, I'm going to be in ministry somehow. You may have heard James say it a while back, and he is still dead set. He is not wavering. In fact, he came into my office this morning, and he's like a kid at Christmas because he's got this plan of what he wants to do for the glory of God. And I said, it's good to have a plan, buddy, but don't, don't be so stuck to it because God will weave you in and out to his plan. And then Lee told me this week while at Somersault, Lauren made a public confession that she wanted to be in ministry somehow, some way too. So church, I share all that to let you know not only are lives being changed in this place, but lives are being changed to the point that, they want, that lives want to be sent out to be in ministry. And that's huge. That is huge. I just wanted to share that with you before I even get into the sermon. So y'all can celebrate that with them later since we're not celebrating now. Anyway, um, so here's the deal. Have you ever known something to do, something that you needed to do, but you didn't do it? You know what you need to do, but you didn't do it. Maybe you look back on the situation and you think, if only I would have been paying attention. If only I would have seen what they saw. If only I would have heard what they heard. If only I would have done something. You know what to do, but you don't do it. Some examples from my life. Things that I'm ashamed to even share with you, but because we try to be real and authentic around here, because none of us are perfect from the pulpit all the way back, we all are sinners saved by the same grace. There have been times that I felt the Holy Spirit kind of knock on my head. You know, hey, Jason, you need to pray for that person. <laughs> nah, God, that's just kind of weird. I don't even know them. I knew what to do, but I didn't do it. Or another time when the Lord said, hey, Jason, you ought to, you ought to offer to pay for their meal. Why, God? I mean, they're here eating out. If they're here to eat out, they know they've got to pay for it. I mean, they know what kind of money they got. You ought to pay for it. I didn't. Someone comes up to me and asks for help financially. Hey, can you, you got money? Can you give me a 10 or 20 or something? And you make excuses. Nah, I don't carry cash. Might even tell a lie. Time of knowing that you should share the gospel of Jesus with someone and you didn't. Because you're thinking, they'll think I'm crazy. I don't even know this person on the elevator with me at the hospital. They will think I'm crazy. You know what to do, but you don't do it. Or in other words, the very good I want to do, I don't, and the very evil I don't want to do is what I do. I think somebody else said that, the Apostle Paul. See, sometimes the evil, sometimes the evil things that we do is what we choose to not do. Did you hear me? Sometimes the evil and the bad that we do is what we choose to not do. So as we are working through the Gospel of Luke over the next few weeks, and, and today we're talking about disciples do see and hear. If you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus is calling us to see and hear those in need and then to respond. See, disciples do see and hear. And here's what Jesus, Jesus never said, the world will know you're my disciples by how much you know. He said, the world will know you're my disciples by how you love. And for Jesus, love is a verb. It's not some warm, fuzzy thing. Love is a verb because it causes you to do something based on what you see and what you hear. And so maybe for us to think about this morning, how often do we when, we, when we have opportunities to see and hear, how do we handle those opportunities? I would imagine sometimes, and maybe more times we would like to admit, we make excuses. Somebody else will help. 
They got themselves into this mess. Maybe we're afraid to help because we're afraid we'll get taken advantage of or we might even get hurt. I mean, hey, everybody's getting shot these days. We don't care. We don't see. We don't hear. It's kind of like the quote from John Hayward that says this, There are none so blind as those who do not see. And the most deluded people are those who choose to ignore what they already know. You know what to do. You just don't do it. And that reminds me of what we said a few weeks ago in here. If it matters to you, hear me out. If it matters to you, you will make it happen. If it does not matter to you, you will make excuses. And there's a big difference between being compliant and committed. Compliant is doing enough just to get by. Committed is I'm going to do whatever it takes. See, disciples do see and disciples hear. Disciples act on what they know. Disciple, a disciple's heart is changed by what they know. And so here's what takes us to our takeaway point today. And this is not only a takeaway point. I would hope and I would pray this will be a prayer for you. This became a prayer for my man, Mike Manley, and it has changed so much of how he views life. But this is the prayer. Jesus, this is the takeaway. Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours. And if you are bold enough to pray that prayer, it will change your life. Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. We're going to be reading a very, very familiar story. And as we read through it, because it is so familiar, as we read through it, the, the temptation is just to kind of zone out. But as we read through this familiar story, I, I would invite you to hear it and try to hear it as best you can with fresh ears. I did that this week, and it has been killing me this week. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10, picking up in verse 25. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself. Hmm. None of us would ever do that, would we? Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came through the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He, the lawyer, said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. See, this story is one of, probably one of Jesus' most famous parables or stories. And in fact, as I shared a few minutes ago, it's so famous among us church people that far too often we just kind of read right through it and don't really fully take it in because we've heard it so many times. It's like when somebody says, let's say together John 3, 16, we just say it and don't even really think about maybe what we're saying. But as we think about this story, I want us to walk through it again 
I want to fully take in what's, what's really going on here. Because something that we oftentimes do not do is, is we don't take into account what happens immediately before this story. So just prior to this most famous story of Jesus, Jesus shares a word of blessing to his disciples because he, he, he's talking about how the wise and the prudent miss what childlike faith sees and hears. And he's blessing his disciples because he says, you know what, y'all ain't the smartest guys. You ain't the wisest and the most prudent. You, you don't know everything. And that's a good thing. Because this childlike faith is what it enables you to see and to hear. So see, disciples do see and hear. And so Jesus just had finished saying that. And we picked up in verse 25. When Jesus had finished saying that, it says, just then. Right after Jesus had talked about what you see and what you hear, just then. A lawyer stands up to test Jesus and he says, Hey Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a reasonable question. And so Jesus answers a question with a question, which is what Jesus oftentimes does. He says, what do you, what do you, what's written in the law? What do you read there? In other words, what's the greatest commandment? And the lawyer tells him, he says, it's to love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. But what he knew but he didn't know is that love is not expressed with just feelings. Love is put into action word, and with our words and with our behavior. Love is put into action. And did you notice how this story is woven together? It's a series of ans or questions, answers, telling of a story, and then questions and answers. And what I also find interesting is that the lawyer knew the answers to his own questions. He knew what to do, but he didn't do it. He knew the information, but he did not see or hear. Another way to say it, he had the head knowledge but his heart had not been changed by what he knew. But in the midst of the questions and the answers, Jesus fully agreed with the lawyer's answers. So maybe we ask the question, well, well if, if that's the case, if Jesus agreed with the lawyer's answers, what's wrong? We have two good questions, two good answers, and two men who agree. I mean, it sounds like the perfect scenario. The lawyer was asking questions, attempting to gain an advantage over Jesus. He was testing Jesus to try to prove him wrong, which we need to be reminded that's the beginning of what's wrong because disciples of Jesus do not prove points. Disciples of Jesus make a difference. What else is wrong? Having all the answers does not mean a person knows God. In other words, you can have a 4.0 GPA in knowing the Bible and still not know God. Because did you hear what Jesus did not say? Jesus did not say, man, great answer, you're my best student. He didn't say that. Rather, what Jesus said was, hey, you go and do. The equivalent for us, that's good old church people, is that every time the church doors are open, we're here, we worship, we're in Bible studies, we do everything, and we can still miss knowing and experiencing the love and grace of Jesus. You have all the head knowledge, but your heart ain't been changed by what you know. You know what to do, you just don't do it. So that's why we should be praying, Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours. And the lawyer asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? If I'm to love God with all that I am and love my neighbor as myself, who is my neighbor? And to even ask that question gives the implication that if I know who my neighbor is, then I also know who my neighbor is not. In other words, if I know who my neighbor is, I know who I'm supposed to love and who I don't have to worry about. And it's then Jesus tells one of his most famous parables and stories, and it's in this story. Again, if we just roll right through it and don't really think about what we're reading, it's in this story, we're going to miss what the original audience heard that day. Because the original audience, they understood the characters in the story. They understood and knew about priests. They understood and knew about the role in, in, their role in society and worship. They understood about the Levites being the temple assistants for the priests. And when they talked about a Samaritan, they surely understood the bitterness they had in their hearts towards Samaritans. 
A little quick history lesson for us about Samaritans. Samaritans were hated by Jews. Samaritans were hated by Jews because Jews considered them to be half-breed Israelites. That all happened after 722 B.C. when the Assyrians came and conquered in the conquest. You had Samaritans who were a descendants of that mixed population of people. And the Samaritans were against They were against the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So devout Jews hated Samaritans. You can read more about that if you're taking notes. Write down Ezra chapter 4 and Nehemiah chapter 2. You can go read more about that dissension about not wanting to rebuild and the hatred there. And because the Samaritans did not want to rebuild, they built their own place of worship on Mount Gerizim. All this makes sense now when you go read John chapter 4 and why Jesus was talking with the woman at the well when she was asking, well, where am I going to worship the real Messiah when he gets here? And Jesus said, you're going to worship him in spirit and truth. The place don't matter. That's just a quick side note. So go home and read John 4. When you get home, it might make a little more sense. But Samaritans, all in all, here's the deal. Jews view Samaritans as ceremonially unclean. They were a social outcast and a religious heretic. And they hated them. The Samaritan in the story is the complete opposite of the lawyer that Jesus is talking to. And he is, the Samaritan in the story is the complete opposite of the priest-Levite characters in the story. And so as Jesus is telling this story, Jesus gets to the part of, but a Samaritan. And I, and I wonder, as Jesus was telling the story, when he said, but a Samaritan, I wonder if the audience was likely thinking, oh yeah, what good can come from there? Maybe there's a little nudging going on. Like, hey, wake up. He's getting ready to bash the Samaritans. Let's see what he's got to say about them. But then Jesus drops the proverbial bomb and the mic when he continues the story. He says, but a Samaritan. And did you hear what the Samaritan did? Jesus said, but a Samaritan came near him. He saw him. Those disciples do see and hear. And next week, we'll hear more about the hearing part. Just throw that in there for a commercial break. Be here next week for the hearing part. Disciples do see and hear. The Samaritan came near him. He saw him. Jesus said he was moved with pity. He went on in the story, and he said, and not only was he moved with pity, but he actually did something. He knew what to do, and he did it. He came near him, saw him, moved with pity. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He put oil and wine on them. You know what that means? That means it cost the Samaritan time and money. He didn't stop there. He put the man on his own animal, which means the Samaritan had to walk. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. And I read this story so many times, I missed this part. It said, and the next day, which means... The Samaritan and the man who was left on the side of the road dead stayed at that inn, which means the Samaritan not only had to pay for one room, but two rooms maybe. Time and his money. That next day, he told the innkeeper, he said, hey, you know what? Here's two days' wages. I'll be back by. If you need something more, let me know, and I will follow up with you. I will pay you what else I owe you. Because I'm going to come back, and I'm going to check on this dude, and I'm going to pay you anything else I need to pay you. And then Jesus summed and finished up this whole conversation, and he asked the lawyer a question after telling the story. He says, who do you think showed mercy? And if we're not careful, we'll miss that, 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 that word of mercy because the Greek used for mercy this time The only time this Greek used for mercy is used is when it's used talking about the mercy of God or the mercy of Jesus. And in this story, what Jesus is doing is he's setting it up so that the the Samaritan is being portrayed as an image of Jesus. The least likely. And so really what Jesus is doing in telling this story, and I love this, what Jesus is doing in telling this story is he's shattering all the categories of who are and who are not the people of God. In other words, what Jesus is doing is he's maybe just maybe wanting his disciples to know what makes the gospel so offensive is not who it keeps out, but more who it lets in. 
See, now looking at this story, what we are hearing is we are hearing Jesus call us, his church, his disciples, to see and to hear those who are in need and to act in love without a preference, condition, partiality, and expecting nothing in return. Now, as we wrap up, maybe you're thinking, so what, Jason? So what? I hear the story. I've heard the story. I appreciate you being so passionate about this story. But, Jason, I would never walk by someone in need and leave them in a situation like that. And I would look at you and I would say, you would. Because we have. We, not you, we have. We do. And sadly, we would likely do it again. See, the drive and the impact of this parable calls us to imagine who we identify with the most. There's three characters in this story. The priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. And this picture is being painted of who do we identify with the most. See, oftentimes we, we imagine the priest and the Levite just being horrible and nasty people. And they weren't. They knew what to do, they just didn't do it for whatever reason in the story. A picture is being painted of, of how well these leaders must have known the information but failed to act on the knowledge of what they have. Again, sin is not just the wrong that we do, but I think even more, sin is the good that we do not do. To the behavior in the priest, uh, the behavior of the priest and Levite, it, it, it's not commendable, but it was not without reason either. We've been there. That body on the side of the road, man, that could be a plant by robbers to get me. If the priest and the Levite were to have come into contact with this body on the side of the road who was almost dead, that would make them defiled, that would make them unclean, that would, that would mean they were hindered from doing what God had called them to do in their place of worship and their responsibilities. I mean, and, and, and to top it all off, that would make them late for whatever they were supposed to be doing. To put it in a 21st century idea, I'll be late to the office if I stop and do that. I can't. I don't have time. 21st century idea, if I go over there, my church people are going to think real bad about me, about who I'm associating with. But a Samaritan. See, the Samaritan was delayed on his own journey. He took an amazing amount of energy and care for this nearly dead person. He risked danger to himself. He spent two days' wages and then the assurance that I will pay even more. If there's more. And all this from an unclean social outcast that was considered a religious heretic by the devoutly religious. And so, so what? When you try to put that in 21st century idea, the profile of the Samaritan is hard for us to comprehend. So the best I can to help us comprehend that is maybe to ask you the question to think about who is the worst person you would consider that would be unclean, outcast, and a religious heretic? You got that in your mind? It probably didn't take some of us real long. Who is that one person? Maybe just maybe Jesus says they're the ones that's showing true mercy and love to their neighbor. Maybe Jesus would say, why don't you go and do likewise? In other words, who was the neighbor to the man in the ditch? And let's not just think about a literal ditch, but let's think about those who find themselves in the ditches of life. And maybe just maybe not just in need of physical things, but who's in the ditch spiritually that you know you need to come along beside? Even though you ain't real crazy about them, you know you need to come along beside them and you need to show them some love of Jesus. Because they need to know the love of Jesus. So will you go to them is the question. Will you know what to do and do it? Or will you know what to do and not do it? And will you begin to pray this very simple yet life-changing prayer? Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours. What about you? What about me? What are we doing with the knowledge that we have in our head of who Jesus is? Is it changing our hearts so that the world in which we live, the world around us, can be changed?
Disciples do see and disciples hear. Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours. And if you are bold or crazy enough to say that with me, I would invite you to say that with me right now. Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us for the good that we know we should do and that we do not do. Forgive us for the times that we've made excuses to not help someone. And I pray, Lord God, that we would pray this prayer seriously for Jesus, you to break our heart for what breaks yours so that, so that, the world will know you and know your love by your church. Because it is us, your church, that you have chosen to share that love. In spite of how messed up we are, and maybe that's the beauty of it, I think. God, we are so messed up, you use us, broken vessels, to share your love. God, break our hearts, what breaks yours. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. And help us to act on what we know. In your name we pray. Amen. As we close with this song, I want you to know as best you can this altar is open around the camp. As we get ready for vacation Bible school, this altar is open. If you want to pray in your seat, you're welcome to pray. But pray that prayer. Jesus, break my heart for what breaks yours.
Jesus is calling us to see and to hear. To take what we know, let it change our hearts and do something with it. So it's time to go, church. It's time for the church to leave the building. And pray that our hearts are broken for what breaks the heart of God. As we go in the love, the grace, and the hope of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join hands together. Thank you.